I wish I could wow. travel with you all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't get to hear stuff like that. <laughs> Good evening and uh, welcome to what I sure will be an informative and I hope an enjoyable evening. I um, am so proud to be sitting here with this young woman. I, all <laughs> right. I, I actually have known her since she was a teenager, <laughs> so you can see that. Uh, and she still gets all the respect in the world that I could give to anybody that has done for her community and for the world what she has taken on as her duty to do. So I'm glad that you are here. <laughs> I'm glad that you are here to be part of, and I was actually surprised when I got the note about this to say this is her 20th year in Congress? 20 years in Congress? Yeah. My goodness gracious, I guess she's a little older than I thought. <laughs> <laughs> well, good evening again, Congresswoman Lee. The 20 years reminds me of some things we were chatting about backstage there a while ago. And that is about the history of women, black women particularly, in the Congress. Talk a little. You threw some things out at me that I just couldn't believe, and I'm sure the audience would. Well, hearing. first of all, Bella, let me thank you for this <laughs> evening. And also, I just have to thank you for being such a role model and a leader. You know, Belva was the first African-American woman journalist here in the Bay Area, and she has, like, <laughs> shattered so many glass ceilings. So many. <laughs> And also, I just have to, and I know we'll probably talk about this later, but uh, when I worked for the late, our beloved Congressman Ron Dellums, we put together a delegation to go to Cuba in 19, what, 77, 78, and Belva mm -hmm. said, I want to go. Mm -hmm. Belva did a film, it was called Yankee Come Back, and she won the Emmy for TV uh, documentaries that year. Yeah. And so this woman is a visionary and a trailblazer <laughs> and very bold and courageous. Yeah. Huh. Okay. Yeah. And so it's really good to see you again. Yeah. 1789 was when the first uh, Congress met, right? Mm -hmm. Now, does anyone know how many black women have been serving in Congress since 1789? Would anyone know? I'm the 20th one. Okay. The 20th. There have been, I think, approximately 41 African American women since the first Congress. And I share that because when I um, went to Congress 20 years ago, uh, there were very few, I think maybe 10 black women there also. And I actually started in politics through Shirley Chisholm. This is the 50th anniversary of her being elected to the United States Congress. 50 years, first black woman. Okay. And I, got, I said, how did she do this with one? We had nine or 10 when I got there and 20 now. The institutional bias and having to fight within the institution in terms of equity and in terms of breaking down some of the barriers, but you're also constantly fighting for social justice and economic justice and for change for the country. And so women, and especially women of color and African-American women in Congress really are fighting on many, many fronts. But um, you know what? We're winning and we're changing the country. And come election time, uh, November the 6th, we're gonna have more women of color ever. We'll have more African-American women. We'll have more women in the United States House of Representatives. And I think that really will, help us begin to regain the soul of America. Why don't you talk a little bit about why, with all of the interests, and you have a multitude of interests, <laughs> uh, that the Congress became the place where you thought there could be some change made uh, that a ordinarily gifted person uh, had a chance at making change. Uh, so you, you held some other offices here in the state before that, but you fell in love with the Congress, it seems to be. <laughs> well, I worked for Ron for 11 years, and uh, I'm by profession a psychiatric social worker. I have my MSW. Mm -hmm. I started a community mental health center when I was in graduate school at UC Berkeley. 
and I called it Change Incorporated. It was Community Health Alliance for Neighborhood Growth and Education because what I wanted was to bring mental health services into South and West Berkeley. And what happened, and I'm a trained psychotherapist, I uh, saw people and, and worked with people who were depressed, uh, who were down and out, who were feeling bad, who were, whose self-esteem was shattered. And then I, and so I had a class project, and we were required to look at uh, mental health services in the Bay Area. And so I looked at what was happening in the African American community and in Southwest Berkeley, and through my clinical work, decided that psychoanalytic psychotherapy was not going to help these low-income black women who were struggling to find a job and couldn't find daycare. Mm -hmm. And so when Ron asked me, and I went to Washington to work as an intern for Ron during uh, the Watergate era. And he asked me if I would come back and uh, work in his office. And I said, and I, I really was um, torn because I wanted to continue with my mental health center. But what Ron convinced me of is that, look, Barbara, you're dealing with people who are suffering and people who are really going through so much because of policies and because of funding priorities and because of discrimination and because of economic insecurity. And so he suggested to me that working in Washington, D.C., I could deal with the root causes of the problems. And so I came back, finished graduate school, and raised enough money, uh, hired a staff and a board, and went on back and worked for Ron. And uh, I saw then that um, I could really uh, be an advocate for people to prevent what was taking place in clinics, to prevent people from uh, being homeless, or to prevent people, you know, from, uh, or, or to make sure they had their daycare or a job. And then when I had returned to California, I um, actually continued to work for Ron. And I decided, this is when I turned 40, I wanted to see if I could uh, <laughs> create some jobs for people. And so I actually left Ron's staff and started a business. I think you remember Lee Associates. And I actually, for 11 years, employed 400 people and paid uh, a living wage with benefits. I was a Teamster contractor. And I was really proud of the fact that my mother, my late mother, my sister, myself, we were able to run a company and do that. And during that time, John George said, Barbara Elihu Harris is running for mayor. Uh, we want you to run for the assembly. I said, no, I'm doing this. He said, no, we have to have somebody, a progressive African-American woman in Sacramento. And so it was Supervisor John George and several others who came to me and asked me to run. And so I ran for the California Assembly and Senate, the first uh, African-American woman elected to, from Northern California to the Assembly and the Senate. And then when Ron retired, unbeknownst to me, he was, you know, uh, I didn't know he was going to retire when he did. And um, he said, I want to pass this baton. <laughs> I said, wait a minute. <laughs> I've been doing this. He said, no, you've, you've got to do this. And so it wasn't that I planned to run for Congress. It was kind of like that's just where life took me. But it's because of public service. And I believe, truly believe that with whatever I'm doing, I've got to be uh, making some changes, changing the world, changing the community, making life better for everyone. And so this is just another platform to be able to do that. It wasn't the job. <laughs> Well, you have been surprising yourself as much as you surprised a lot of other people all of your life. And we skipped over it because it happened so early in your career. But the work you did for, for Shirley Chisholm and ending up at the Democratic National Convention, I mean, how did a young a woman of your age at that time position yourself so that a Ron Dellums could feel comfortable knowing that you knew enough from the ground roots out to, to make whatever needed to happen, uh, life better for people here? Well, you know, I was president of the Black Student Union at Mills College. I have to say, Bill Moore, your, your husband, Billy, he, he knew me then, Bill, but he came, used to come out to the campus with his camera crew wanting to interview me, and I, no, 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 I don't want to, and he used to make me, <laughs> you know, and I was very shy about interviews, but said, we gotta hear you, gotta know what you're doing. So as president of Black Student Union, uh, I was very active also with the Black Panther Party as a um, community worker. I wasn't a member, but I worked on the breakfast programs. I worked bagging groceries. I worked on the clinics and the survival. Pro I, you know, I did a lot of community work with the Panthers. And uh, I had a class. Now, all this is simultaneously going on while I'm on public assistance, food stamps, welfare, 
two little boys I'm raising and had just come out of a terrible uh, situation, domestic situation, terrible divorce, and uh, had a class in government. And part of the course requirement was to work in one of the presidential campaigns. Then it was Muskie McGovern Humphrey. And I told Dr. Mullins, my professor, I said, uh, flunk me. I've never flunked a class, but I am not working in any of those guys' campaigns. <laughs> <laughs> I said, no. She said, why, you've got to do this. I said, I don't care about passing this class. And I was a pretty good student. Because they didn't speak to, and I was very conscious politically, but I had never registered to vote, never gotten involved in partisan politics at all. I, I, and I see Black Lives Matter, and I see movement young people now, and I really identify with that because that's where, you know, I'm a, I'm a millennial, <laughs> Black Lives Matter movement person. And so uh, I was going to flunk the class, but when I invited Shirley Chisholm, I invited her as the first African-American woman elected to Congress. So she came, she spoke at the student union, and she said she was running for president. I said, what? And you know, the media didn't cover her campaign. And so I went up and I talked to her afterwards. And of course, I had my big afro, my jeans, and uh, you know, power to the people. And, <laughs> and so Shirley said to me, little girl, and I had two little kids, and I was in my 20s by then, was a returning student. She said, if you really believe in what you say, if you really want uh, to change this world, then you've got to get involved in politics. I said, well, look, I have this class. I'm about to flunk. I said, maybe. I said, maybe I'll just end up working in your campaign and just go on and pass the class, because I really believe in what you stand for. She, now, Shirley Chisholm spoke fluent Spanish. She talked about immigrant rights. She was against the Vietnam War. She talked about uh, ending poverty, just all of the issues economic inequality. I mean, she was unbelievable as a progressive African-American woman. So I said, well, you're someone I can believe in. So she took me to task, and she said, little girl, you have got to register to vote. I said, no, 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 not me. I'm a revolutionary. You know, I'm not going to rally. I don't want anything to do with this. She said, you've got to register to vote. She said, because, you know, you've got to get on the inside. You've got to shake things up, she said. And you can't go along to get along. You've got to be part of changing the system. So I went back and talked to Dr. Mullins, told her, I, so I asked Shirley, I said, where is the campaign? Who do I call? She said, I'm leaving it up to my local people. I have no idea. She said, I don't have a lot of national money. It's up to folks. Bottom line is I went to Sandy Gaines, who was then president of the student union at uh, Mills College, and Sandra Swanson, who was president of the, uh, who was, became Ron and my chief of staff, and he was the black student union leader there. And we formed the Shirley Chisholm Northern California campaign right out of my class. Uh, I got an A in the class. <laughs> And I went on to Miami, Florida as a Shirley Chisholm delegate. And that was in 1972. <laughs> OK. And it was in, during that time that I met Ron and yeah, got a chance right. to work with him also. And see, it's important that you know that the seeds were planted <laughs> by the best of people, because she has always made great choices. She gives Ron a lot of credit for what he, oh, he, he earned. But uh, Ms. Chisholm was the person that I think uh, sprinkled the seeds on the soil for you. I just wanted people to hear about that. And as you matured and thought about whether, you, you know, this business of passing it on from Vellum was, was a good idea, what were, you, what were, were there any competitive ideas? Were there ever at any point when you felt, well, maybe this is just a little much? you know, the, the, what they, what's required of you for, for public service at this time? No way. <laughs> no way. I, I never blinked. You know, sometimes people try to uh, plan their life, mm -hmm. and I, I'm a person of faith, and I, I kind of, like, follow mm -hmm. my instincts and follow what I believe is the right thing to do next. Mm -hmm. So I have, in spite of this being a really hard especially now, uh, being an elected official, especially being an African-American woman, is difficult. Mm -hmm. You know, discrimination rampant. You have to be twice as smart, twice as this, twice as that, with all of the barriers that are still there. But uh, I believe in public service, and I believe that to whom is given much is expected. And, and somehow I've managed to get through a lot of stuff that young women go through, all kinds of stuff that I wrote about in my book. Mm -hmm. And uh, if I could get through that, 
you know, then I have a duty and responsibility to give back and help others. And that's just kind of who I am. Well, we have learned that you have your own, uh, what, what will I call it, <laughs> your own criteria for what is enough and, and when I have to move on and then, or maybe when I have to jump over something that is blocking my path. So we're certainly at a time now when things are blocking our paths all over the place. So we may as well get to the dilemma that we find ourselves in with what's going on in Washington right now. And just, uh, I'm sure we'll come back to, a, hopefully, some questions here. But just give me your impressions of what it's like to be there in the environment that looks like uh, television soap opera almost <laughs> from day to day uh, as things change and personalities come out uh, differently than you expected. Well, I tell you, being there, for me, first of all, it's really a privilege and an honor, and I have to thank my constituents for that, because if I were somewhere else and dealing with this stuff, I'd probably have punched through the TV screen and <laughs> engaged in, <laughs> you know, I mean, so to be there in the midst of the fight, to believe that you can, you know, push back and resist and, and make some changes and come out on the other side, to me, uh, is where I need to be. Mm -hmm. And that's how I see this. I mean, every day, you, you know, you get up, um, I say my prayers, and then I just feel like I put on whatever uh, battle uh, garb I need to put on and go to, up to the hill knowing that uh, Democrats are in the minority, but also knowing that people are relying on us you know, to do the right thing and to push back on this right-wing, mean-spirited agenda. People are counting on us to not only resist this uh, Trump administration, but they're counting on us to put forth what we will do after November 6th. Mm -hmm. And so to me, uh, it's really an honor and a privilege to be able to do that. And, um, and in many ways, Belva, it's, it's not surreal because I guess, and for women and for African-American women and women of color, who have a history of struggle in this country, this is just another struggle. You know, we've been through so much. The, hey, who else can fight this? <laughs> who else knows what, it, what the deal is? <laughs> who can see it very clearly? <laughs> you know? Well, I think that uh, w one of the questions here alludes to the fact that uh, women have been in the struggle for a long time, and you've led many of those struggles, or showed up, but told us there was a way out. Um, but it's getting a little bit harder to think there is a way out. Does it affect people who've had as many victories as you've had to know that we're in the kind of position we're in today? First of all, it, some people say it's frustrating. I don't say it's frustrating. I say that um, it's disgusting, uh, it's sad, you know, and every setback is an opportunity for a comeback. Mm -hmm. And we're coming back strong, Belva. I think, wait, we're coming back strong, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. I've been traveling. I'm going to continue to travel to help candidates take back this house. I've been in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, New York. I'm going to Texas, North Carolina, back to Colorado, Nevada, uh, Georgia. You just name it. And all of us are doing this. Mm -hmm. And what I'm seeing out there People are tired of this mess that's going on, and they're tired. They see that the clock is being turned back on voting rights and women's reproductive health, on environmental protections, on labor uh, workers' rights. They see this happening, and so they're fired up. And, I've, and so that gives me a lot of hope that uh, while we have to see the reality of where we are, that the country is moving forward. And, uh, and I shared this story earlier. I was in uh, Bethlehem, Pennsylvania recently, uh, a couple of nights ago. And there was a, a rally I was asked to participate in. And it was sponsored by Vote Common Good. These were evangelicals, former Republican evangelicals who have re-registered as Democrats. And they're taking a bus tour all around the country to help us turn the house blue. Now, if that didn't give me hope, and they wanted me to speak <laughs> with them. And I mean, it was a wonderful event. And so if, if 
You know, so I see this going on all around the country. So that's what keeps me inspired and very hopeful because, you know, you have to keep hope alive. And that's what I think I have to communicate to so many young people and other people who say they are tired and, and feel a sense of despair and depression. Uh-uh, we don't have time for that. Mm -hmm. oh. A question from the audience. What can we do about the Supreme Court now that it looks like Kavanaugh will be confirmed? First of all, have you made such an assumption already? Well, it's listening to the senators and what they have been saying, uh, from Flake to Collins to, Man I mean, this is like horrible. And uh, first, I believe, you know, victims of sexual assault, survivors of sexual assault. I believe Dr. Ford, every woman who has come forward, trust me, I know, I believe them, and and it's disgusting and it's a shame that, that they weren't believed by these Republican senators. And so their day is coming, you know, their day is coming. And, um, you, you know, the um, Senate, I mean, it's going to be a hard fight after November, but we're going to have to do investigations. We'll, uh, if we do our work between now and November, the oversight, uh, the, uh, of course, the Trump administration, we uh, now have standing in court for violating the Monuments Clause of the Constitution. You know, I'm a plaintiff in that lawsuit where uh, he's making money off of foreign governments. I mean, that's against the Constitution, it's against the law. So we have lawsuits we're filing. So there are gonna be a lot of things going on. And you know, if, if and when Kavanaugh is um, confirmed, I, I am certain that we're going to move forward to investigate a lot of these allegations. And who knows where that's gonna lead, but th th we can't let it stop now. We can't let this stop, because every woman deserves their voice to be heard and to be believed. And so, you know, trust me, we're moving forward. How loud do you think the message might be to women who have a complaint, who heard the eloquence of the people who have spoken out, and uh, Will they be discouraged, encouraged to move forward, to speak up, to fight back? What, what, will, what do you think will be the, the long-term outlook? Well, you know, it's, been, it's very hard to do what Dr. Ford did. We know what the statistics are in terms of 60% of, of women uh, never disclose these uh, traumatic, horrific, terrible experiences. But now, uh, I, more women are calling, members of Congress calling our offices, calling everyone, sharing their experiences. And I think out of this, women are, are becoming, uh, as traumatic and as horrible as it is, becoming empowered to uh, really understand the, what the deal is and we'll move forward unified and try to uh, change this and to be heard and to speak out. Uh, and if, even women who still cannot come forward, there are other women speaking for them now. Mm -hmm. And so just know that uh, we're not going back. Mm -hmm. And when this man, if he gets on the Supreme Court, you know, we're gonna have to, to be very vocal and clear on his decisions and what the courts do in terms of women's rights. So we have to be ready for the street heat, and we have to get more engaged, and really r recognize that now we are gonna speak on behalf of all of the uh, sexual assault survivors who didn't have a voice in this instance, but who now, because of the women who have come forward, and Dr. Ford, Ford and others, uh, now have a voice and a seat at the table, mm -hmm. so. Which brings us to the topic of what What's next? What's ahead? Uh, the person who wrote this note said that when the House of Representatives is flipped in the midterm elections, what do you think the three top priorities will be to tackle? <laughs> <laughs> there are a lot. Well, first, one of the reasons why we have to take back this house is our system of checks and balances has been totally eroded. You know, we do have uh, three branches of government, but you don't know that right now. And so one of the one of the reasons we have to do this is to reinstitute our system of checks and balances. So one thing we have to do is put a check on this president. His, you know, just stop. We have to stop his agenda dead in their tracks. That's, we have to do that. Uh, and so we're gonna talk about what our 
top three or four priorities are, but rest assured, health care is a big issue, and we have got to make sure we uh, figure out how to reduce the, and we can do this, cost of prescription drugs, and not only uh, preserve and make sure people have health care, the Affordable Care Act, but figure out uh, a way to cover, ha have universal accessible health care for all. And when you look at infrastructure, I mean, we're talking about an infrastructure bill that we have it ready to go. Mm -hmm. And so we need to look at how we're going to create more jobs, good paying jobs with benefits through an infrastructure bill. And I think that will be uh, on our agenda. But also when you look at, uh, and what I'm pushing for is, is housing, because the federal government has not done much on affordable housing and displacement. And we've got to raise that to a priority in our agenda. And that's everywhere I go now, everywhere in the country, people can't afford to live. They can't, where they grew up, they can't afford to rent any a place for their family. They can't afford to purchase a home. So we've got to put housing and, and economic uh, security and inequality as part of our uh, top priority. But as part of the Democratic Caucus, we're formulating that now. And what we're doing is making sure we win, but we do know that we're going to have the oversight hearings and the investigations uh, will move forward with uh, Elijah Cummins, who's phenomenal as chair of the Government Reform Committee. Mm -hmm. And so just know it will be a very strong agenda that's not just a democratic agenda, but it'll be an agenda that's going to speak to the aspirations of everyone in, in the country. Mm -hmm. Now, you see, we all have to think positively. She knows all of the stuff below the line <laughs> that we don't quite know about yet, and yet uh, has this, this faith, uh, this expression of faith, so that's good. Um, what are your thoughts, though, on moving forward with something like an equal rights amendment or yeah. has that day come and gone the day has come today? no and we have we need an equal rights I mean come on I mean it's like please I think uh, we have legislation yeah, and hopefully we'll be able to get that through sooner or later mm -hmm. but um, yeah that day should have come and gone but we still don't have it um, and we're not part of the uh, Convention on Against the Discrimination of Women either. We're one of the few countries that, uh, CEDAR, mm -hmm. that are not in that. So we, we've got a lot of work to do as it relates to women's equality. But uh, we've got so many women now, over 40-some percent of the candidates on our side are women. And so believe you me, we're going to have a lot more women to push these uh, bills forward. Mm -hmm. And the women that you meet who see the same things we do, and many of people like me feel somewhat depressed when I look at the problems ahead, still seem to show a lot of enthusiasm and are filing and running for office. Now, what do you think is uh, for that group versus those of us who sometimes feel helpless, what, do you, what can we do to get more of whatever the knowledge or the spirit that they've captured out of this uh, to be more persuasive in, it, oh. in this society so people don't feel so depressed? Yeah, that's a really good question, Belva, and that's up to all of us because we know um, cycles in history. Mm -hmm. And these women who are running, uh, let me tell you, one of the things that um, I've noticed about all of them, and most of them hadn't even thought about running for office, they just know how bad it is and what the Trump administration is doing to their communities and to their country. And they are smart, they're passionate, uh, they, uh, for the most part, all of them who I know and have met, which is most of them, the one quality they all have is that they're authentic and they relate to people. They understand the pain and the suffering that people are going through and the living on the edge in many communities. And so I think they're fired up because they want to do what we've been doing, and that's trying to make life better. And, and so that's what's, what's motivating them, is to, to make life better for their constituents and to help uh, bring this country back uh, in terms of the fragile nature of our democracy. A lot of the candidates that we talk to know that we're right on the brink 
and and we're worried, mm -hmm. and they're worried. But instead of uh, being depressed and feeling down about it, they have decided, as women do, to do something about it. And they're women who are going to get the job done. So be hopeful. <laughs> We've got to be hopeful. You know, we got to work hard, and we can't look at the world through rose-colored glasses. But we have to be hopeful. And and I tell you, being out there, uh, really, as hard as things are, make me feel good. Were you surprised somewhat that America, as America's image, uh, changed so fast when most people? seem to not be looking, uh, that it's possible to find some magical moment or some cause or some uh, any one method that might bring more hope uh, other than the Democrats mm. winning back. <laughs> <laughs> Let's start there. <laughs> Let's start there. Well, no, with Donald Trump in the White House, you know, the rest of the world, as you saw at the United Nations, are kind of laughing, mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. at us. But what I've learned, and, and I travel quite a bit abroad, people in, uh, abroad all over the world, they know the difference between the Trump administration and the people of the United States. And they send messages back, you know, like, look, we understand what's going on. Mm -hmm. And we know the American people. And we, we appreciate our generosity and, and, you know, what we stand for. But they see this as really um, setting us back, just on the Iran deal, for example. I mean, the rest of the world <laughs> stuck with it. Of course, Donald Trump pulls out. Uh, and it's working. It, the uh, weapons, you know, the nuclear buildup and the weapons were, that were being built, they've stopped in terms of nuclear buildup. Uh, when you look at Cuba, I mean, Barack Obama, and you know, we've done. I've been to Cuba near 30 times since the mid 70s, just trying to normalize relations with a country 90 miles away. This Trump administration now has taken us back 50 years. Well, we mm -hmm. people in Cuba, though, still understand that we've got to normalize relations. And so, people around the world in Africa, uh, you know, in Central America, calling these continents uh, and countries as holes. Mm -hmm. You know, well, in the appropriations bill, I had to reaffirm our commitment to the continent of Africa given this president by writing in language that said we reaffirm our commitment <laughs> to development and trade and, and foreign assistance on the continent of Africa just so the people in Africa understood that, um, and I got Republicans to support it, that as a Congress, we're not, we don't see them in an asshole country. So we have to work as a Congress to try to just uh, keep hope alive abroad that the American government not doesn't necessarily right now reflect the sentiment of the American people. Mm -hmm. Well, we know that um, it's going to take more of Barbara <laughs> Lee's oh, enthusiasm and knowledge and background uh, to get us out of the cloud that, that many of us find ourselves in today. So what has been your most difficult decision or vote in the climate that we've just described where things are changing? Yeah, some votes are very difficult, but the 2001 um, voting against, my voting against the authorization to use military force in 2001, that was the hardest vote. <laughs> it was hard. And it should have been the easiest because it, this was three days after the horrific attacks. Just to paint the picture very quickly, my uh, former chief of staff, his uh, cousin was Wanda Green. She was on Flight 93, okay, which was heading in. I'm sitting in the Capitol and had to evacuate that morning early, like 8 o'clock. Uh, so it hit us personally. We quite naturally had to respond and, and under try to figure out what was going on. I mean, 3,500 people killed uh, you know, to this day, I mean, we're still dealing with the trauma and the sadness around that. Mm -hmm. But in no way, after three days, should we come up with a resolution that just said it was 60 words, and it said, in essence, the president's authorized to use force forever against any organization, nation, individual connected to or even 
thinking about nine, you know, 9-11. I mean, it was just that overly broad. And so that, to me, was not the right moment to put us in a state of perpetual war. Uh, it was not rational. We, as members of Congress and elected officials, sometimes we have to go against the grain. Yes, the country's mourning. Yes, it's angry. Yes, we've got to do something. But you elected us to kind of be rational and not go with the flow at the moment. And so all I said was, let's step back for a while and let's look at this, let's be methodical, let's determine the most appropriate response rather than responding with a blank check to keep us in war. Fast forward to now, we that resolution has been used 40-some um, times in 17 or 18 countries with no connection to 9-11, drone attacks, Yemen, Somalia. I mean, it's just been used all over the world. It's a blank check. And so that was a tough vote because after that, all hell broke loose. I mean, I had to deal with, you know, a lot of stuff that was pretty nasty. And uh, it, was, it, was, it was hard. But you know what Ron used to say to us as staff? He said, look, if you think you're right, if, if you think you're right based on the Constitution and your conscience and, and the policy, do the right thing. He said, you stand on the corner and just sooner or later, everybody's gonna have to walk to you. And fast forward to last year, and I've been working now for 17 years to repeal that authorization because as long as it's on the books, any president can use it for any reason. And so last year in the Appropriations Committee, my uh, amendment, which I try every year, two or three times a year, to repeal that and to have a debate on these new wars that we're in and to vote up or down on them, that passed with Democrats and Republicans voting for it. It passed. But by the time it got to the Rules Committee, which is the next step, Paul Ryan, more than likely at the orders of Donald Trump, just took it out of the bill. <laughs> I mean, they were just that undemocratic. So we're coming back, and we're coming back, and we're coming back until it is done. That authorization needs to be repealed, and we need to make Congress do its job. It's been missing in action. It's our constitutional responsibility, and we have just abdicated that entire uh, part of our work. So we're going to keep at it until it's done. But that was the toughest vote, Bella. Well, <laughs> we started to talk a little bit about uh, your own progress of getting you know, into the leadership positions that you're in now in the Congress. And we mentioned Ron Dellums and his legacy and his influence on you. Are there any more Ron Dellums in the Congress where you are now? Yeah. You know, Ron, first of all, Ron charted the course for a lot of people. And uh, Ron was a, such an incredible human being where he was a very progressive politician. Uh, he was elected, uh, and they called him a commie pinko from Berkeley, right? But yet he became the first African-American to be appointed to the Armed Services Committee and the first to chair the Armed Services Committee. Ron was one of the most, still one of the most respected members of Congress. He knew how to maintain his principles and his values as a progressive, chair a committee that he disagreed with on the policy, vote against the bill, yet everyone else had their input and w were able to feel good about the product that came out of his committee. And there are a lot of members of Congress uh, who uh, do the work very well uh, and also want to work in a bipartisan way and with everyone, you know, Democrats and Republicans in the, in the Congress. So Ron kind of set a standard that a lot of my colleagues like to emulate. And it's in those moments of crises, though, that sometimes people get a little worried about the politics in their districts, you know, because everything has become so political uh, now. And so I think what I see is, a, a, you know, worrying about a vote that could uh, be a hard vote back home. Now, yes, you have to respect and, re and represent your constituents. That's your first priority. But also, like Ron, uh, and I talk to my colleagues a lot about this. Um, sometimes you have to educate your constituents. You know, you're elected to lead. 
And so in some moments, just like after 9-11, you may need to have to go home and just say, this is why this was the right vote, and try to help bring people along. And, and so, yeah, there are, there are a lot of members of Congress who are, are trying to do that, I think, in a very uh, respectful way. Um, what will it take, really, to enable term limits to be enacted for the Supreme Court. <laughs> I almost feel embarrassed to ask you that. <laughs> A lot. But let me tell you, I didn't, let me tell you, at, I, at an event, someone asked me, how do you impeach a Supreme Court justice? And I wasn't sure of the answer, and I told him I would have to, determine, you know, look at that. And a young probably 14 and 15-year-old uh, teenager answered that question. He told me it takes 65 members of the Senate to impeach a uh, Supreme Court justice. <laughs> and so, you know, I, <laughs> I have no idea. But uh, hopefully, Ho hopefully, we'll figure it out. <laughs> well, well, since we're on the topic, tell us about how you think these last few days have played out in terms of justice being served through the process we're just going through with in this selection of this yeah. gentleman. This was a miscarriage of justice. It was not justice at all, first of all. This investigation was a sham, and I guess Senator Flake was trying to do the right thing or find some cover, I don't know, but ultimately, you can't have an investigation, uh, an FBI investigation, and come up with how they did it, the process, and the outcome was just outrageous. And uh, so hopefully, people will see it for what it is. And, and again, November 6th is the time to uh, register our outrage and disapproval of what has taken place. Because this week, and I have to just say right now, uh, I'm so appreciative of Senator Feinstein and Senator Harris for how they dealt with this. You know, we have two senators that we didn't need to worry about, and they tried to push the uh, envelope on this to, so the truth would come out. And that's all they asked for was the truth and the fair process of the Dr. Ford be heard and uh, believed, and uh, they did everything. They did a wonderful job, and I think we need to thank them for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, whenever we seem to get into trouble, it, this is a year, it's time to have another year of the woman. So <laughs> is it that time already? Yeah, it's that time. <laughs> you know, we actually marched over to the hearing uh, a few last week. Uh, some women, we just got together one morning and said, doggone it, we're going over there. We're just going to sit there. And that's what we did. <laughs> and then, um, you know, right after the testimony, we all stood up just to stand there. And we were told we, we were going to get arrested or get out. And so <laughs> we had a press conference afterwards. And I think this is uh, the year of the woman. But I think it's with another perspective also, you know, um, Anita Hill would, you know, they didn't believe or they tried to play like they didn't believe Anita Hill. I mean, she was, can you imagine? We're back there now. Mm -hmm. uh, and Anita came, you know, to my district several months ago and she was phenomenal. And um, she knows and she has said very clearly how this was, um, you know, a setback. But out of that, we're going to move forward. And I think this is a moment that women and men need to rise up and say women who have been uh, assaulted and who are, su have, are survivors and who are traumatized, whether they talk about it or not, this is the time to believe them and the time to, to uh, change the culture and what is taking place in this country because uh, we're not gonna tolerate it anymore. Time is up, really. Time is totally up for this kind of behavior. Well, so we head into uh, troubled waters. I guess that's it. Um, <laughs> what can the party do? And let's just talk really particularly about what can Barbara Lee do. Uh, coming up with this election, with the, the atmosphere being one as we've cast it, <laughs> as uh, oh. having problems, what, what kind of leadership can the Democratic Party offer at this time? What fresh or new things that are being talked about, and where do you stand on the leadership positions within that party? 
Well, I think the part, historically, um, you know, and we may not have gotten, get our message out the clearest way, but that's the criticism I always hear, but historically, when you look at the Democratic Party and what we have stood for, our legislative agenda, I mean, come on, it was, it was President Obama and uh, Nancy Pelosi who shepherded the Affordable Care Act. Millions of people now have health care because of Democrats. You know, it's been Democrats who have really put forth the recovery plan, uh, kept us out of a uh, great uh, depression through the Great Recession. And so Democrats, when you look historically at what we've done and stood for, and if you look at the uh, platform committee and what we stand for, which I helped negotiate between the Sanders and Clinton people, I mean, debt-free college education, most Democrats support, and the majority of Democrats support that. Uh, reducing the cost of prescription drugs, most Democrats, most of the country supports that. Uh, good quality public education, most Democrats support that. Keeping uh, uh, climate change, putting us back into the Paris Accords, most Democrats support that. We fought to get us in. And so, you know, when you look at the history of what Democrats, and I'm certainly not going to defend us to the hilt, but I just have to say, compared to the Republicans, I think we've done a pretty good job. Mm -hmm. And I think people are going to look at us now and see how we're going to lead after November. And so I think that it's a time that uh, I personally uh, am running for Democratic Caucus Chair because I want to be there at the table. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> and it's a race. But I want to make sure that uh, a lot of the issues that we haven't raised to the level of uh, public uh, attention are raised. And I'll give you one example. One is poverty. When you look at um, so many people are working two jobs and living below the poverty line. They need Section 8. They need food stamps. They need expansion of Medicaid just to survive. They're living on the edge. And we're dealing, I'm on the Appropriations Committee, as I said, and on the Budget Committee, we're dealing with these huge budget cuts that are going to put more people into poverty. And so what I want to do is talk about how Democrats can come together with an agenda that really talks about eliminating poverty and providing pathways out of poverty so people don't have to work two and three jobs and commute two and three hours and, you know, have, uh, they can't afford daycare and childcare. So all of these issues are issues that Democrats stand for, but I want to make sure that they become priority uh, for the party. And that's part of my platform. And I think we can unify on a lot of issues, but I think on poverty elimination, when you look at the rural communities throughout the country, you, when you look at uh, the background of people living in poverty, you have, I mean, in this, my district, 20-some percent of children, black children, live below the poverty line. Same as in Mississippi. And so, you know, when you look at um, income inequality, racial inequality, and then poverty, and how it plays out, uh, there's a lot in common that we can bring people around the country together around as it relates to poverty. And so that's just one example of one of the issues I want to mm -hmm. bring to the table. Well, what are some of the best approaches for a woman interested in entering local politics? And I'll say for a man interested <laughs> uh, in entering local politics, because obviously that's what it's going to yeah. take is for more people to... Take part. More people need to, to participate, and I think one I think one quality I think for people who want to run now is what I said earlier in terms of authenticity, and having worked in the community on whatever kind of programs or volunteer uh, organizations or being just part of a community that's advocating for systemic change. And out of that, you know, people come to you and ask you to run. You know, or you can just decide you want to run because you think you can, you know, be part of the change that we need. And so I would say that anyone who wants to run or think about it, get grounded in the community and, and know the issues and know what you stand for. Be yourself. That's really important. Mm -hmm. And talk to people about what you think you can do and what you see as your vision for whatever office you're running for. And then we have to look at the money. We got to get money out of politics. We got to get to public finance and the campaigns. We got to overturn Citizens United. And we've got to really understand that money is such a big part now of running for office. And so we got to fight for public financing at all levels and do that because otherwise, Women, women of color, low-income individuals who need to run and want to run, who could run, well, as long as you have 
the dark money, th that's always a barrier. Um, a question maybe that you might have an answer or solution to here. Uh, as always, you always have an answer or solution. I'm no. sure somebody out there hoped that you'll have a magical one to this. What can you do to help legalize cannibalists <laughs> at the federal level? <laughs> well, I don't have a magical one, but I have legislation that's picking up steam. <laughs> I have one bill. It's called uh, the Refer Act. Uh, some call it Refer. <laughs> but what it does, it says that states which have passed um, legalization of either medical or recreational marijuana, that the feds can't come in and try to stop them. You know, the federal funding will not be allowed to any agency that tries to do that. And we're building up a lot of support for that. <laughs> then I have my Marijuana Justice Act, which is a bill that would uh, take marijuana off of the list of controlled substances. I'm doing this with Senator Booker. It would, because you know that the, uh, the huge population of African American and Latinos uh, in terms of this mass incarceration crisis epidemic that we're facing is because of marijuana beefs, drug beefs, right? Low level drug crimes. So what I'm saying in, in this bill is we need to expunge the records of all of those who have been convicted of a misdemeanor because you know so many, because um, ban the box is so important. So we need to expunge their records. Uh, those convicted of a felony can go before the court and get their records expunged if the judge so allows. But it also, uh, again, takes it off of the list of controlled substances, substances but provides for a $500 million uh, restorative justice fund because so many young people, their lives have been destroyed. So many communities in the black community have been destroyed behind mass incarceration and the uh, incarceration of young men and women for marijuana charges. So we need to provide a second chance for them through uh, entrepreneurial opportunities. I have a bill that would provide for equity in the industry. Uh, we need to provide job training, skills training, education, get rid of a lot of the barriers so that these young men and women can go on with their lives. And, and I'm working on a lot of other than, um, marijuana initiatives with some of my Republican colleagues. But, so it's not a magical answer. It's not going to happen overnight. But just know that I've been dealing with this for years and years and years. And we're picking up now some traction. Mm -hmm. And I think that kind of just says we're on the right track and we're going to get it done. Well, the, the <laughs> another concern and there are many, that <laughs> I'm sure, that are on your desk. How do you help the children being moved to the tent cities in Texas and other places? Oh, my God. Anything? Listen, I went down to um, Brownsville and, and McAllen, Texas, and with a group of women, uh, and I think and some men, and we went into these um, detention centers and saw these kids and these families. And let me tell you, these, these are jails. Okay, they are incarcerating these children and the parents. And it's, it's a shame and disgrace. It's another stain on, on our country. And now, I mean, not to return these children to their parents with the numbers that are still away is, is, is immoral. And so what we're, what we're doing, and it's, it's a hard one because a lot of the data, the agencies that are working with the um, Homeland Security, you know, they, they're not communicating with, you, with each other. We found uh, some, children, some parents didn't know where their children were. You know, the records weren't being kept. And so they were sleeping on uh, cement floors. Uh, it, was, it was horrible. And, and so on the, in the Appropriations Committee, we passed in the law that's coming, hopefully will be signed, several uh, amendments. One is we want to report back right away on where these kids are because no one has been able to tell us where they are. Now we're learning where that they've been in the middle of the night sent to tent cities. So we want them to do that. We want to make sure that uh, pregnant women are not shackled because they were doing that. So we got that passed, uh, which was really hard. So we, on the Appropriations Committee, have done what we could do 
to hold these people accountable. But bottom line is the trauma that's, that's associated with the separation of children from their families is, is uh, generational. When you, um, and when you look at what happened during the Middle Passage, okay, of Africans to this country, part of their st strategy in terms of slavery was to take the children from their parents. So this is another unfortunate, whew, you know, you think about what took place then and the, and the generational, their DNA changes that take place with kids. So this is very serious. And these kids should be returned and returned right away. And believe you me, uh, I don't know one person, one Democrat in Washington who's not working feverishly to get these kids back to their families. But I hope when people go to the polls, they know that uh, Paul Ryan and the Republicans have been complicit in this. The Republicans in the House have l turned their head to this and, and closed their eyes to what was taking place. And um, again, that visit for me um, as a parent, as a woman, as a social worker, as a member of Congress, it, um, it shook me up to the point where uh, memories of my ancestors came back, you know, and knowing what happens when families and children are separated and how the dislocation and the trauma stays with you for years, for generations upon generations. And so just know that um, it's not just a, a six month or a year kind of separation or w whatever they're doing, but this is going to take a long time. There were no mental health services, no counselors available when these kids were being uh, put into these cells. And we saw mothers and fathers, and they had them in prison uniforms. In a prison, mind you, uh, holding them like they had were uh, in, uh, like they had murdered someone. I mean, we can't let this happen ever again. And we've got to keep speaking out against it. And like I say, we um, have to uh, hold this administration and the Republicans in Congress accountable for this. Uh, and hopefully we'll be able to sort this through after November. Mm -hmm. We spoke about housing when we first started to speak. And um, one of the things, of course, that keeps housing projects going is their money, appropriations. And a lot of that used to come out of Washington. I guess it still does. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering what your thoughts about what's happening in your own district in terms of people yeah. being able to find a way to live in, in, yeah. at a style for which we Americans think we're obligated to have. <laughs> well, I think, uh, personally, housing is a basic human right. Everyone should have um, access to decent, affordable, safe housing, <laughs> period. And so part of what I do on the Appropriations Committee is trying to find every dollar I can, federal dollars, to address uh, homelessness, grant money for affordable housing. So we're doing that. Of course, even with the cutbacks, we're still bringing in resources. But it's bigger than that. Uh, we have to find ways that, uh, n not just shelters, but how to move people into transitional housing and then a home. And we have to provide, uh, and this is one of the things I'm working on, is, is eviction assistance. Because so many people now who are on the streets, and if you go to Oakland, you will see this, and other communities, people are living on the streets with chairs and little tables, mm -hmm. their apartment belongings or their house belongings. They've moved into the streets because they've been evicted. Mm -hmm. And so eviction um, assistance is extremely important so people can stay in their homes and or have the the uh, legal fees to be able to pay lawyers to to defend them and so they can move back in. But also, we have to have, um, and I know it's very controversial, but I support uh, rent control. I support Prop 10. I mean, I think that it's important that local jurisdictions can begin to see how they want to address the housing crisis. My district uh, is one of the districts that's highly gentrified now, and displacement is occurring each and every day. And people who have historically lived in my district, now uh, I go to, um, for example, when I'm in Georgia or in Nevada, 
campaigning and doing other things in churches. I run into 10 or 12 of my former church members who say, don't you remember me? I was a member of your church. I couldn't afford to stay in Oakland or Berkeley. And so it's really, uh, it's really uh, bad what's taking place. And we have to find ways, and the federal government has been missing in action on this, but um, Secretary Castro, to his credit, and I did through the Appropriations Committee, force the federal government to talk about how displacement can be addressed at the federal level. And so we're beginning now to see what all we can do from the federal government, because again, it, it's never been a federal issue to begin to try to uh, stop what's taking place. But it's a, it's a crisis, it's a state of emergency. And um, you know we have to recognize the fact that everyone deserves to stay where they want to stay, and they should be able to afford to live in the communities in which they grew up. And, mm. yeah. Well, I'm sort of surprised at this next question, because it, uh, if you had to choose uh, your successor, who would you choose? <laughs> this is a woman who never gets below 80% of the vote <laughs> in her district. So the question has a little bit of Oh, there's no way. <laughs> if, even if I knew, I wouldn't even <laughs> say. Because I think what's important is that, you know, leadership emerges from grassroots. Mm -hmm. People determine who they want to uh, represent them. And, uh, you know, I think that it's important that, uh, like, Ron passed a baton to me because he saw something in me that, and I had worked and people asked him and people asked me and you know, it wasn't me deciding I wanna run for Congress. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so I think it's important for people to really uh, emerge. And that's how I think good leaders uh, evolve into being uh, you know, great legislators. Mm -hmm. And that's my answer. And, uh, so there are no names I would even come up with because I haven't even thought about it. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about dreaming to, into the mm -hmm. future. What are the things you're going to go back, you're going to be in the same Congress you're in with some of the same people you just left. So therefore, how, how do you think about or even develop a dream for the future in this environment? It, are the tools there, number one, for things to happen the way things are set up under this administration at this time? I think that um, the tools are there. And, and again, the Congress is a legislative body. I mean, we, we, set, we make laws and set policies. And I think we can pass some good laws. Mm -hmm. The question is, can we get it through the Senate and to the White House? Mm -hmm. But uh, that's what we have to do. And I think if we got it, you know, good laws, good policies to the White House, and if um, <laughs> 45 <laughs> vetoes them, we could override those vetoes. Uh, we have, if we have enough members of Congress to do that. Mm -hmm. And so we have to be hopeful that we can do that. And I mean, there are many, many, like I just keep citing the infrastructure bill because that's like high on the list of priorities mm -hmm. because of what infrastructure, and, and we're talking about infrastructure in the broadest sense. I mean, we're talking about schools, we're talking about broadband and communities that don't have access to uh, technology and computers, you know, so we're talking about major infrastructure. And if we could work out our infrastructure uh, initiative and policy and get it to uh, the desk in the White House, mm -hmm. uh, if he vetoes it, send it back. And uh, I'm confident on many of these policies and laws we could override the veto. Mm -hmm. It's gonna be hard, but, that's, we, but we have to do that. Mm -hmm. you know? well, I'm sort of saving this question. We're down to our last few mm -hmm. minutes because uh, I don't think there's a ready answer out there. The Dems need a plan. What is their plan? Why don't they have a plan? <laughs> the plan is to win. <laughs> yeah, but we're working and, and when you look at what our plan has been in terms of economic security, working for the people, reducing the cost of prescription drugs, infrastructure, 
health care, making sure everyone has access to affordable health care. I mean, we have a good plan. We just don't have, because this, we shouldn't have the exact pieces of legislation yet because we have to wait until we come together and put that together. But we have, I would say, within uh, 30 to 60 days. And remember in 06, we had the uh, 6 for 06 mm -hmm. plan. And we got all of those bills passed except one. And that one was the comprehensive immigration uh, bill. And so we'll roll out our plan. And it will be a robust plan that will speak to the uh, needs of the country and to uh, everybody. Uh, and uh, it's, it's going to be a plan that I think everybody can be proud of. But right now, it, really, it, this is about uh, saving our democracy. It's about making sure that we take back the House and the Senate. And it's about, in the next 30-some days, focusing on uh, getting our votes out. Voter suppression is real. You know, um, tampering Russia's influence over these elections, is that's real. Um, efforts to stop people from voting in many states is real. We've got lawyers and people looking at uh, voter protection strategies right now throughout the country. And so we, we've got to protect the vote. Uh, they just actually, in the appropriations bill, denied funding for elect, um, election security. We were trying to, the Trump administration said, no, you're not going to, we're going to take that out of the budget. And so we've got a, a lot of work to do for November 6th. And that's what I hope everyone focuses on and helps us work on. And then after that, we'll be ready to roll. Ready to go. Zero, zero. Time's up. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's been a pleasure chatting with you. Uh, not chatting, I'm sorry. Well, I'm talking with you today. But as you walk away from the stage and you listen to all these questions, most of them require a miracle for solution. Mm -hmm. uh, could there be a miracle? Will there be a confirmation vote? And will it go <laughs> your way? <laughs> OK. Uh, the vote is tomorrow, right? Mm -hmm. And if the vote today signals how the vote will go tomorrow, uh, you know, I'm not um, confident that, uh, you know, Dr. Ford and all of the survivors of sexual assault uh, will feel good about that vote tomorrow. But again, uh, we have to, uh, as we say, stay woke and just know we're up for the fight for another day. And I think that we've made, um, women have made uh, a lot of progress through this process over the last few weeks. But um, I'm not confident that that vote is going to go the way it should go in, in terms of justice and in terms of a lifetime appointment for, um, this, uh, for the Supreme Court. And so that's being very honest. And, you know, I hope I'm wrong. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, can I say something about uh, thanking the Commonwealth Club? I just have to thank you because I can remember when the Commonwealth Club was like off limits for me as a woman and as an African-American. In the 70s, it was like, oh, no, 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 you don't even go and think about the Commonwealth Club. So I want to thank you for being such a shining light and a beacon of hope for, for all of us. Thank you. <laughs> And I want to thank you for knowing what the term leader means. <laughs> oh, thank you, Belva. And I want to thank you for, you know, the hard questions and for your leadership and for really uh, being, um, you know, such a role model to so many of us. And like I look back on your life and wonder, how did you do it <laughs> by yourself? <laughs> and you're still doing it. So thank you again. Well, it's all Bill's fault. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thanks, George. Thanks to the club. And thank you all for joining us. Thank you, guys. <laughs> <laughs>